All right, 10.02, many um, people have joined from all over the world and we're very glad to also welcome everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live. So on behalf of this webinar's co-hosts, Stand.Earth, Friends of the Earth and the Rainforest Action Network, I'd like to welcome you online who are taking part in this virtual event. It's really wonderful to see so many people joining from all over many different locations today and from such a diverse array of interests. My name is Sapora Berman and I'll be your moderator today. I'm the International Program Director at Stand.Earth and also the Chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative and an adjunct professor at York University Environmental Studies in Canada. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Clahoos and the Hamalka First Nations as part of the reconciliation process in Canada and in fact in many places around the world. At Stand.Earth we urge you um, to recognize the unceded traditional territories that you are on. If you don't know what those are you can always look them up. Native-lands.ca. I'll ask one of our team to put that in the chat for you so everyone can have that reference. Today we'll be looking at how everyday products in our homes are connected to serious environmental and social impacts around the globe. Our focus is on Procter & Gamble, the world's largest consumer goods company, and what it must do to make its products truly responsible. Some of the themes we're going to unpack today are also emblematic of bigger issues that, that heads of businesses, government, and agency leaders need to take appropriate action on. Forests are one of our planet's most critical tools to slow the onset of climate chaos. They're also a refuge for the ever-increasing march of industrialization and are places where the future of indigenous cultures and threatened species are at stake. Our hope is that those of you in the audience today that are from Procter & Gamble and who truly want the world to be a better place, those of you who represent large assets and investments and those in government and regulatory circles will walk away with some more motivation and information and some inspiration to use every bit of your influence to ensure that greenwashing is always opposed, that the integrity and accountability and the res highest respect for our shared home and all of its peoples is adhered to. As your moderator, I also want to be transparent about the fact that in this instance, I am not a neutral party. As a Canadian resident and longtime forest activist, active advocate, I'm quite astonished that we're still witnessing ancient and intact ecosystems, threatened species habitat, in the traditional territories of many First Nations, areas that have never been industrial logged, get logged for products like Bounty and Charmin, the number one toilet paper brand consuming intact boreal forests. And representing millions of concerned citizens around the globe, I'm deeply saddened that critical forests and laborers' rights are still being trampled in Indonesia and Malaysia because of the insatiable demand for cheap palm oil. These issues can and should be addressed. As a mother, and hopefully a future grandmother, I'm proud to be a part of a global community that's calling on Procter & Gamble to fundamentally change the way it operates. Mr. David Taylor, as CEO of this company, I want you to know that there are hundreds of organizations representing tens of millions of people that are calling your attention to these critical imp issues that impact all of our future. To put it plainly, your products are continuing to cause harm. If government turns a blind eye or fails in its responsibility to enforce existing laws because of politics or undue corporate interests, it certainly doesn't mean that massively resourced companies like Procter & Gamble can't still operate with the highest environmental and social standards. We know that Procter & Gamble has taken some positive steps in the right direction and has ambition to keep doing better and we applaud the company for being on this path, but we're asking you to do more, much more, and to quicken the pace of action. Having no time-bound plan for addressing threatened species habitat and human rights abuses in your products simply can't continue. Today, we're gonna to hear from a number of speakers from around the world. On the Canadian Boreal, first we're going to hear from Reverend Nelson Pierce from Beloved Community Church. 
Yusuf Munir, a youth activist uh, from the Youth Activist Coalition, and Jen Mendoza stands on the ground forest campaigner, who are kicking off a three-day vigil, vigil from Procter & Gamble's hometown of Cincinnati. We'll then turn to Shelley Vineyard, the Boreal Ca Corporate Campaign Manager of NRDC, who will look at on-the-ground impacts, investment risks, and opportunities. We'll then turn to Joe Fobister, environmental leader from Grassy Narrows First Nations, Dave Pierce, Forest Conservation Manager of the Wildlands League, Rachel Plotman from the David Suzuki Foundation, and then Trison Brethwaite, a youth activist and TikTok personality. Moving to our panel on Southeast Asia, we'll hear from Bria Morgan, Senior Forest Campaigner at Rainforest Action Network, Esmeralda Lopez, the Legal and Policy Director of the International Labor Rights Forum. Jeff Conant, Senior International Forest Program Manager at Friends of the Earth. And then we'll hear by video from community representatives in Indonesia, um, uh, um, two different videos from Wally, Friends of the Earth Central Sulawesi, Indonesia, and then Denise Hartono, Executive Director, Friends of the Earth Central Kalimantan, Indonesia. So let's get started. We've got an exciting hour and a half for you. First of all, I want to remind folks that this webinar um, is being recorded. Recordings will be emailed to registrants afterwards, and we are live streaming this on Stan.Earth's Facebook page. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom or put them in the Facebook live chat. They will be curated. We'll take questions at the end of our time together. Next slide, please. Please join us on social media. Tell us what you think about what you're hearing on Facebook uh, and Twitter at stand.earth and Instagram at stand.earth. Follow the story and participate with the hashtags issue with tissue and keep forest standing. So we know that the Canadian boreal is a major sourcing area for Procter & Gamble for products like Charmin and Bounty. As someone who worked on the Canadian boreal forest agreement over a decade ago, I'm truly horrified and disappointed to see that the lack of adequate government action and irresponsible corporate supply chains are still driving massive fragmentation and loss of this climate critical primary forest. Stand Earth is a core partner with NRDC and others in North America who are working to ensure that Procter & Gamble take more responsibility for their supply chains. Consider the Amazon of the North. The boreal forest stores more carbon per hectare than any other forest on earth, except for mangroves. The boreal's home to over 600 First Nations and billions of migratory birds and a wide array of many species. Year over year, we hear more alarming stories of the shrinking intact area of the boreal. In fact, every year, logging companies clear cut a million acres, over 400,000 hectares of boreal forest. It's a small city block every minute. Fragmentation is causing massive decline of caribou, a threatened species that federal and provincial governments are failing to take appropriate action on. Procter & Gamble pulp demands for Charmin, Bounty, and other tissue products are contributing to this forest degradation and deforestation. So at this time last year, up, up in the lead up to the 2019 shareholders meeting, we were in the midst of quite constructive negotiations on forest sourcing in the Canadian boreal. Unfortunately, we couldn't come to collective terms regarding Procter & Gamble's unwillingness to ensure that their suppliers are upholding free, prior, and informed consent when operating in Indigenous territories, or that their suppliers would cease operating in critical, threatened species habitat, specifically caribou habitat, Despite a government directive that a minimum of 65% of undisturbed forest should be maintained in each caribou range. Government has not enforced this and Procter & Gamble continue to source from companies operating in these critical areas of caribou habitat. We've been organizing in Cincinnati and around the world ever since. Jen Mendoza is, on our, is our on the ground forest campaigner. So Jen, you've been at it for over a year. We understand that you're there today with some local faith and youth leaders. Over to you.
I'm not hearing Jen. I'm wondering if others are hearing Jen. How about, how about now? There you are. Hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Mendoza. I am a, a forest campaigner with Stand Out Earth. I'm here with uh, my great friend, uh, Nelson Pierce, Reverend Nelson Pierce, and he's going to lead us off. Good afternoon from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, my name is Nelson Pierce, Jr. I am the pastor of Beloved Community Church, um, and I stand in the tradition of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., um, who reminded us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And 2020 should have convinced us, um, if we were not already convinced, that we live in a web um, of interconnected mutuality. And so we've seen in 2020 how COVID um, has impacted the worldwide community. Um, we've seen in 2020 how uh, the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota uh, set off waves uh, that rippled throughout the worldwide community as protests happened and took place all over the world. Um, and today, as we come to hold Procter & Gamble accountable, um, we have to remember that P&G's actions um, in Canada, in the forest, are impacting not just uh, the people who are local there, and not just those of us who are in Cincinnati, but it has a ripple effect throughout the entire world. Um, we have learned what happens when we ignore science and when people put uh, greed and profit um, over, uh, over care for our earth and care for the people in the world. Um, and so we have to uh, declare that it is a moral imperative that we protect the delicate balance of nature. Um, that we must commit to caring for all of creation, that the air that we breathe, the water that sustains our life, the fruit of the lands that nourish us, and all of this, we are all connected together, and without this, humanity itself cannot flourish. Climate change and the loss of biodiversity are a threat to our future, and addressing them is a moral and spiritual imperative. That we believe that our response to global climate change should be a sign of our respect for creation and that we must take this climate crisis seriously and act with urgency to fulfill our moral obligation to steward the earth. And so we are standing with so many leaders who are here to urge Procter & Gamble to stop flushing our forest and to continue to improve its policies in meaningful ways that will address how its products are causing harm. Yeah. Yeah. Peace be upon all of you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I begin in the name of Allah. My name is Yusuf Munir. My pronouns are he, him, and I am a local youth leader in Cincinnati, Ohio. I lead a high school organizing group named Young Activist Coalition. And I'm here because I need to be here. Because if I want any shot at having a future, I need to be here and I need to be in PNG's house every single day until they decide to stop flushing our forests, until they decide to respect indigenous sovereignty, until they decide to get critical caribou habitats outside of their supply chains. And PNG can afford to do the right thing. Just last year, they made $12 billion in profit. They can afford to do the right thing and don't believe their lies. Don't believe they're greenwashing because that's all just an excuse to at the exact same time they're telling us about how great it is to recycle, to disrespect indigenous peoples, to cut down these critical forests, to, to endanger already endangered species. Don't believe their lies because their lies are just a way for them to tell you that their $13 billion, that David Taylor's next bonus is more important to them than my future, my entire generation's future. My generation's right to clean air, to clean water, to, to a world that is not on the brink of global collapse. My generation's right to just live. They've told us that their $13 billion in profit is more important to them than me, than my future. So my question to you shareholders and to all of the people that are on our side is just, is, is that $13 billion really worth more to you than my future, than my generation's future, than your kids' futures, than your grandkids' futures, than our collective future? Is it really worth it? It's not. It's not. Dang. <laughs> well, I gotta say it was 
Hey everyone. Uh, so uh, Jen Mendoza here again with uh, Stand. I'm a force campaigner. And um, wow, thank you to all of these beautiful people that came out here today with us. Um, and I just want to say that I'm here today because, you know, I have a stake in the decisions that this company makes. Um, and you know, we, we all do. We have, we have a responsibility because Procter & Gamble are right here in our backyards. Um, but you know, in a world that often makes us feel powerless, a world where we watch a justice system constantly fail us, a world where police are murdering innocent people, a world where innocent children are in cages as we speak, a world where corporations like Procter & Gamble loot indigenous lands and take the resources and leave a path of destruction behind them, we have been left with two choices. We either give up entirely and walk in defeat, or we fight like hell to protect our people and our planet. I have chosen to fight with the sacred tradition of nonviolence and use full bodily, bodily autonomy to do so. Today I'll be beginning, I have begun a 72 hour hunger strike or AKA a fast um, because I am choosing to reclaim some of the power that has been stolen from all of us. Myself and my brothers and sisters here today will hold space out here in peace and in prayer over the next three days to shine a light on Procter & Gamble's fourth destruction until the shareholders pass this resolution. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Jen, Nelson, and Yusuf, and all of you who are in Cincinnati right now, um, standing up uh, for what you believe in. It, you know, really important to hear your passionate words and also appreciate your dedication and your time. This moment that we live in calls, us, calls on all of us uh, to stand up. Uh, and 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 to take action. Uh, really appreciate what you're doing. Stay safe um, out there. So we're going to turn now to um, some of the reasons why we're seeing such passion and such action on the ground, and in fact, in many places across North America, people who are concerned about Procter and Gamble's uh, sourcing, concerned about what they're seeing. That's happening in our climate injustices, disrespect for human rights, like the indigenous people who um, are seeing this type of logging in their territory without their consent. So joining us now, we have Shelly Vineyard from NRDC. Shelly, over to you. Hi, thank you, Zipporah. Good afternoon, my name is Shelly Vineyard and I am the Boreal Corporate Campaign Manager for the Natural Resources Defense Council. NRDC is an international environmental advocacy organization and has a long history of fighting for the conservation of places like Canada's boreal forest. Places that are vitally important to local communities and also critical for the global climate and threatened species. I'm here today to talk about how Procter & Gamble is failing these communities, failing the planet, which is our home, and failing to take full responsibility for its own supply chains. You can go to the next slide, please. A year and a half ago, NRDC and Stand on Earth released the report, The Issue with Tissue, How Americans Are Flushing Forests Down the Toilet. This report highlighted how some of the biggest American tissue makers were fueling devastating treat, a devastating treated toilet pipeline. In the report, we released a scorecard outlining the leaders and laggards in the tissue world in terms of their sustainability. All three of P&G's brands, Charmin Toilet Paper, Bounty Paper Towels, and Puffs Facial Tissue earned Fs in that scorecard and in the second version of that scorecard, which was released earlier this year. Next slide, please. P&G makes its tissue products entirely from virgin forest fiber, including a significant portion from Canada's boreal forest. In fact, they are the largest U.S. purchaser of boreal tissue pulp. 
Based on our research and conversations with the company, we found that this pulp is coming in part from threatened boreal caribou habitat and some of the most vulnerable parts of the remaining intact boreal forest. In RDC, Stan.Earth and others raised our concerns with PNG several years ago and urged them to require caribou protections from their pulp, boreal pulp suppliers, as well as requiring free prior and informed consent, FSC certification for all virgin fiber pulp, and a reduction in the company's reliance on virgin forest fiber. Next slide. Thus far, PNG has largely failed to act on any of our requests. While they have committed to increasing the fiber they purchased that's certified by the Forest Stewardship Council to 75% by 2025, they continue to purchase pulp from threatened caribou habitat for toilet paper and other throwaway tissue products. They lack a requirement that their suppliers implement free prior and informed consent when operating in indigenous and traditional communities territories. They continue to falsely claim to the public and to shareholders that industry dominated certification standards like PEFC and SFI protect species and uphold indigenous rights. And they lag behind their peers in terms of forest sourcing commitments and upstream climate goals. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, this inaction extends far beyond PNG's pulp sourcing and into its palm oil supply chain as well, which other groups will get into later. later. When we began discussing our experiences with the company, with our partners at RAN and Friends of the Earth, we noticed some commonalities in PNG's approach to palm oil and pulp sourcing. PNG has an over-reliance on third-party certification systems to uphold its sustainability commitments. And when its suppliers fail to meet PNG's own commitments, the companies largely failed to establish clear consequences for those suppliers and has delegated response to the third-party certification systems themselves. Also, according to the risk analysis platform Chain Reaction Research, PNG delegates management of its supply chains to its individual sector business units within which each brand is housed. Based on our, our own group's engagement with Procter & Gamble, we've not engaged with anyone at the company who's approaching PNG's forest sourcing risks from a holistic perspective, providing a comprehensive approach to mitigating its impacts. Overall, PNG has a broad lack of upstream accountability for its suppliers, which enables serious negative outcomes on the ground and creates significant risk. This is why the investment firm Green Century Equity Fund introduced a shareholder proposal this year on PNG to issue a report on how it can increase the scale, pace, and rigor of its efforts to eliminate intact forest degradation and deforestation from its supply chains. The actions PNG has failed to take create enormous risk for PNG shareholders. You can go to the next slide. Namely, competitive risk. PNG lags behind peers like Kimberly Clark in terms of climate commitments and approach to tissue product manufacturing. Um, and corporate ranking initiatives like the Forest 500 and CDP Forest rank PNG behind its peers. And other companies like Unilever have made much more transparent, aggressive responses to addressing grievances. Next slide. PNG's actions also create reputational risk. With every new piece of evidence of PNG's ties to human rights abuses and forced destruction, its reputational risk grows. It has had negative coverage on CBS this morning for its pulp sourcing and extensive coverage in the Associated Press about its ties to FELDA, uh, which has been uh, sanctioned by the US government for its uh, forced labor practices. Chain reaction research put the reputational risk associated with just with PNG's palm oil sourcing at $41 billion, which is 14% of equity, and noted that this cost dwarfs the cost of solutions. Next slide. And then finally, uh, this PNG's actions create regulatory and operational risk. PNG's current practices put it at risk of regulatory and operational impacts as well. In fact, my colleagues at RAN will get into this later, but a recent import ban on palm oil that PNG has ties to is clear evidence of this risk. Next slide. Investors have shown an enormous amount of interest in these risks in this shareholder proposal so far. 
By PNG's shareholder meeting next Tuesday, our groups will have briefed roughly 30% of PNG shareholders, or more than $90 billion in PNG equity. For any investors on the call, we urge you to support this resolution, which is item number five on PNG's shareholder meeting agenda. For everyone else, if there's one thing I hope you take away from this presentation, it's that PNG is failing to take care of our home. They have the resources and the responsibility to change their practices, and they should do so as quickly as possible for the sake of our forests, our communities, and our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley. A lot of information um, uh, for, or for shareholders and others packed into a very small period of time. Um, joining us now from Northern Ontario is Joe Fobister, a community member and environmental leader from Grassy Narrows First Nations. Joe is joining us by phone. Let's see if we can hear him. Joe, are you there? I can't hear Joe yet, so I'm just checking in with our technical support. Can we unmute Joe's line? Joe, you may be muted yourself. You may need to click star six on your phone. Okay, um, am I on? Yes, you are. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm, uh, yeah, my name is Joe Fulvester. I'm uh, Anishinaabe uh, or Indigenous. Uh, I'm from Grassy Narrows. Uh, my friends call me JB. I'm, uh, a trapper, hunter, fisherman. Uh, my, uh, initially, I was uh, chosen by my elders to speak for them. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, 20 years ago, we took a stand against uh, harvesting on, in our territory. Uh, our territory was uh, harvested uh, quite extensively uh, between uh, 300,000 fi and or 500,000 cubic meters of wood was being taken from our territory, and we put a stop to it on, on, on uh, December 2, or December 3, 2002. And uh, since then, we've uh, stopped uh, all the logging from our territory, and uh, there's been no trees taken out from our territory in the, in the time that uh, our uh, blockade went up it's been 20 years and uh, and I'm very happy to announce that uh, the blockade's still going on today. I, uh, we've, uh, we've been meeting with uh, the government of Ontario to, uh, to uh, you know, change their, their, uh, their har harvesting methods. Uh, and we've uh, taken action against uh, Logging companies who uh, wish to, uh, uh, you know, harvest in our, in our territory. We've um, did marketing campaigns. We've uh, we've uh, protested. We've uh, taken court actions against uh, the government. And so far, there has been no. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of success. I'm uh, very happy. My uh, my uh, community is very happy with uh, with. Uh, but the results that uh, we've uh, we've seen, uh, you know, there's still our, our fight's not over. It still goes on today. Um, we we, are, we continue to fight <clears throat> on the land and, and courtrooms and, and uh, meeting rooms and everywhere. We have uh, a, a very powerful group. We have uh, we our community. My community uh, held a, a referendum. On uh, on uh, on whether or not uh, our community would allow any more logging, and this happened uh, three years ago, and uh, our our community voted uh, uh, by 75 percent to uh, not allow any more logging. Uh, my my chief uh, made a a land declaration banning all all uh, industrial activity from our territory on uh, October 18, two, uh, 
two years ago or two, <laughs> whatever that was. But uh, and um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it gave us uh, a boost in our fight, and uh, it, it works. It, uh, we hold uh, uh, the government. Uh, we, we make them understand that uh, they need free, prior, informed consent before they need to before they can do anything on our territory. We rely on uh, on a treaty that we uh, signed in 1873. Uh, it was on October 3rd. 1873. My great 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 grandfather was a signatory to the treaty. We uh, we uh, we understand what you know what my great great grandfather wanted, and he wanted uh, uh, you know, uh, a relationship with the uh, with the government that we that we were signing a treaty with, and we we hold them accountable to the treaty, <clears throat> and. Uh, I'm sure my great great grandfather would be very very proud of his people that uh, you know, that took a stand, and, and I'm uh, very proud to be a part of my community fighting for the for the, the you know the future generations that uh, will be born. And uh, uh, just recently, we've uh, started negotiating with the uh, government government of Ontario to. Uh, to uh, recognize a portion of our, our territory as, a, as, a, as a, an indigenous protected area. And uh, we are making progress and, and uh, we are close to uh, uh, having an agreement in place. And uh, we, there's still work to be done. And, uh, and uh, I hope that, uh, you know, that uh, we will be, We'll, we'll be successful in having our uh, territory um, protected forever. And that's uh, my presentation for my community. Thank you so much, Joe. And, and thank you for all your leadership and work. It's an, an inspiring what uh, your community has and is doing. Um, and 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 also, um, you know, frustrating uh, that you, you've had to take uh, these court actions. Um, the uh, campaigns uh, to protect the boreal forests that have been run by NRDC and Stand Out Earth have also been, of course, uh, working um, with many other impacted Indigenous nations um, uh, across um, uh, across Canada. Um, you know, it's. Um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard um, from Deputy Grand Chief Mandy Gull, the Cree Nation, who's also spoken uh, about concerns about the industrial logging um, in, in her territory, and in fact, in the territories across uh, the boreal. Unfortunately, they were unable to join us today because um, of a family emergency. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the team from NRDC, though, to put a link in the chat um, to all attendees if you would like to read uh, the words of Deputy Grand Chief Mandy Gall about her concerns about Procter and Gamble's sourcing and what's happening in Indigenous territories as well. Um, uh, I urge you uh, to take a look at um, uh, at that blog. Um, next, we're going to hear from um, Dave Pierce uh, from the Wildlands League. Um, Dave is uh, going to be uh, is a forest conservation manager and is going to be telling us uh, about the deforestation risk in U.S. supply chains coming from Canada, with this particular focus on Ontario. Over to you, Dave. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, if we could just advance to the next slide, I hope. Great. Um, so Canada doesn't know it, but it has a deforestation problem. And the Wildlands League has exposed a massive and ignored footprint of industrial logging on Ontario's public lands. These are vast areas of treeless and barren, what we're calling logging scars, that are persisting for decades in the boreal forest. Um, these impacts really threaten wildlife like caribou and they, they really counteract Canada's efforts to mitigate climate change. Now our study expands areas, includes, including those used to supply Procter & Gamble. Next slide, please. We found that over 22,000 hectares are deforested each year in the boreal forests of Ontario. 
And over the past 30 years, that accumulates to an estimated 650,000 hectares of forest that's been lost. Now, uh, for an American audience, that's 1.5 million acres, or equivalent to eight times the area of New York City. It's a huge area. And by 2030, when Canada is supposed to be hitting its Paris climate agreement targets, the amount of lost carbon that's supposed to be sequestered in these lost forests could, could be equivalent to more than a year of emissions from all the passenger vehicles in Canada. This is it's incredible to us because, because governments and industry have been saying for years that Canada has near zero deforestation rate. But it didn't really jive at what we were seeing in the bush, especially when we flew over areas like this that have a, a, a noticeable pattern. So we decided to take a closer look. Trevor Hesslink is our uh, Director of Policy and Research. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. And he actually went out and measured the impacts of the roads and landings and other disturbances. He used uh, remote sensing and aerial photography, a GIS analysis. But then he went out and bought a drone and spent two of the summer vacations out in the field, drove around and mountain biked around and did on the ground verification. And what Trevor found out was that after the first three decades of loggings, um, the roads and landings typically remain barren. So 30 years out, they're still barren. This problem's been ignored by officials because there's a, kind of an assumed a, uh, optimistic belief that all these areas, well, they'll grow back eventually. And amazingly, this assumption really hasn't been scrutinized by anyone until now. Uh, next slide, please. The main culprit in all this is a, a very wasteful practice uh, resulting from what's called full tree har harvesting. And when they clear cut, they bring the entire tree from the stump up, they leave the roots in the ground still, uh, and then that's dragged from the stump to the roadside and it's processed there. And there the merchantable logs are stripped of the branches and tops and the, all the unmerchantable bits and, and species they don't want are left behind. And the tree waste accumulates and it basically smothers any regrowth. And then in addition to that, you have compaction and heavy machinery that also takes a toll. Uh, next slide, please. So we sampled over almost 300 sites in Northwestern Ontario using remote imagery. And then Trevor Ground Truth, 27 of those sites. So about a 10th. And many are within the caribou ranges and the harvest areas of companies that supply Procter & Gamble. Now these logging scars impact many, many times their own area for caribou habitat. And they're not growing back and caribou are basically being squeezed out. This uh, full tree harvesting uh, method is used in many other places in Canada outside Ontario. So our findings may be only the tip of the iceberg of deforestation in Canada. And next slide, please. So it's, it's clear to us at the Wildlands League that business as usual, usual forestry should no longer be permitted in the last remaining intact forest uh, of Royal Canada. We're in a climate crisis and a, an extinction emergency, and we need to, to restore these logging scars, and governments and forest companies need to use the resources much more than we had with a drone and a pickup truck and a bunch of mountain bikes to measure accurately the impacts across the country and make real evidence-based decisions. And companies like Procter & Gamble need to step up and demand the same from their suppliers. You can go to loggingscars.ca to find out more and you can click on explore and you can see the extent of deforestation for yourself. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dave. Really interesting research. I'm going to turn now to Rachel Plotkin from the David Suzuki Foundation for a little bit more on the forest reforms that are needed, that are critical for our, cli for their, our climate, indigenous rights, um, and threatened species. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Sapora. I'm here to talk about boreal woodland caribou, which are threatened with extinction, but it's important to note that boreal caribou are also an umbrella species. That means that if we can protect their habitat, we're also protecting the habitat for numerous other forest dwelling species that depend upon intact habitats. Next slide, please. For boreal caribou, we know that the primary cause of their decline is habitat loss and degradation, and primarily habitat loss and degradation at the hands of industrial activities, things like logging roads and clear cuts that change the patterns between predators and prey and make predation more successful upon caribou. Um, what we don't know for many species is how much disturbance is too much. I think for 
Species at risk, this is often one of the biggest management challenges. And at first it wasn't known for caribou. I was at a number of workshops where people were just, forestry companies were doing experiments and in all of their experiments, you know, we'd leave 30% um, in old growth and 70% in 60 years old, um, or we'll, we'll just try a number of different experiments. Caribou continued to decline. So the federal government appointed a team of scientists, 18 of North America's leading caribou experts, and they graphed out um, a, a meta-analysis of the relationship between ranges um, that had disturbance and calf survival across Canada. So next slide, please. This analysis is shown um, in the federal recovery strategy, and there's no magic number, but along the one axis is the amount of disturbance in a range, and along the other axis is the percentage of probability that calf will survive in 100 years. Next slide, please. Based on this, the federal government released a recovery strategy in 2012 that directed provinces to maintain a minimum of 65% habitat that's undisturbed in each, range, in each range, or in instances where that had been surpassed, to restore to a minimum of 65% undisturbed habitat in each range. And the provinces gave, the federal government gave provinces and territories five years to develop caribou range plans that did so. And it's important to note that again, the minimum of 65% isn't a magic number. And in fact, it affords caribou merely a 60% probability of persistence. Next slide, please. The federal government also identified the current status of the provinces. And you can see that wherever a province or wherever a range in a province here is orange or red or yellow, it means that the caribou population is unlikely to persist unless significant changes are made. Next slide, please. So what has happened since then? The recovery strategy was released in 2012. Well, in 2017, the federal government released a progress report on the implementation of the recovery strategy that noted that in most ranges, habitat continued to be degraded and caribou continued to decline across Canada. Next slide, please. Um, and I just, I just to want to check, I'm no longer hearing Rachel. Can other people hear Rachel? I can hear Rachel. Oh, great. Sorry, Rachel, that must have been my um, uh, internet. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, another thing that happened when the science was released is that industry rallied to fight back against the requirement to protect the minimum of 65% of each range. And my next slides are sourced from an article um, that was written by a number of my colleagues that looks at um, how industry copied the tactics, the successful tactics often, of climate change deniers. So one of the first tactics is they deny the problem exists. So here's an example. The Ontario Forest Industry Association often says, oh, caribou aren't really at risk at all. They're more popular than deer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, they also claim that the problem is too costly to fix. So uh, we have heard a number of times um, in from small communities that if there is caribou conservation, then um, communities are going to be ber economically bereft, when in fact, the main cause of the loss in forestry to date has been mechanization and global market forces. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, there was one that was missed, um, which is also that they, um, industry denies that they are the source of the problem. Um, so it's the one before. Anyways, it doesn't matter. I'll just talk to it. Deny the, uh, um, that they are the source of the problem. So they might say, well, caribou are at risk, but it's not really our fault. Um, caribou are at risk primarily because of climate change. And that is something that we've seen um, in particular from the Forest Products Association of Canada, which is a, a, the national forestry body that says, look, don't, go, don't move too fast. We need, to stop. we need to slow down. We don't want to do protection measures because we're worried maybe climate change is what's driving caribou towards extinction, not our activities. So as another of my, um, oh, and another of my colleagues already mentioned, there's also a significant amount of greenwashing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is an example from Ontario <coughs> where Procter & Gamble is one of the biggest purchasers of pulp. Ontario just released a um, forest sector strategy that um, aims to double the amount of wood logged in Ontario. 
and where it comes to its ideas about promote, um, promoting sustainability, all that it says is we're doing a great job, we just need to get that out there already. Um, next slide, please. The good news is that there are solutions. I think a number of my colleagues on the call today will um, touch upon them, but we really believe that there is room for both um, logging that is sustainable and caribou uh, survival in the boreal forest. Um, we have the science that we need, that risk-based relationship can be used by forest managers and provinces to ensure that at the end of the day, we're sharing the land with wildlife so that while we're extracting um, forests and, and, and turning them into things that many of us do need, um, we're, share, we're ensuring that there's enough forest left for caribou to have a home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a, a, a lot of information in a very um, short period of time. It was astounding to me um, that the information that you gave that in 2012, uh, the government um, accepted scientific recommendations that a minimum of 65% of undisturbed habitat needs to be maintained. You said they gave them five years. So that's 2017. Yet today, the logging companies are still operating in that critical habitat. That's and right. Procter and Gamble um, and other companies are making tissue paper and toilet paper from this critical caribou habitat in those areas that are 65% supposed to be protected. That's, that's correct? That's correct. To date, there is not a single finalized and implemented range plan that takes the federal government's directive and turns it into practices on the ground. It's very interesting, you know, when I started working on boreal forest issues somewhat 15 years ago, we were just having this exact same conversation. It's astonishing to me that over a decade later, we're still having the same conversation. And, and given the failure of, of government and the logging companies to act, I think that reinforces even more what we heard from those folks um, uh, on the ground in Cincinnati, um, that it's up to Procter & Gamble to ensure that its uh, sourcing is, is, is responsible. Um, Thank you so much. We're going to move now um, to uh, Trison Braithwaite, um, who's a youth activist and TikTok personality. We're getting it all um, on this webinar today. Um, so um, Trison, over to you and why this issue matters for your generation. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Zipporah. Okay, so it's not news to anyone that climate change is going to be the greatest challenge of our lifetimes. Oftentimes when we speak about climate change and the bad actors and the circumstances that led us to where we are today, we only mention oil and gas companies. And there's more greenhouse gases in the air or in the atmosphere than there, were at, than there was at any other point in human history. And although oil and gas companies have played a major role in exacerbating the climate crisis, they're not the only bad actors. You see, Procter & Gamble claim to be carbon neutral in their direct operations. In actuality, their direct operations directly impact vulnerable communities like indigenous communities, not to mention their disastrous impacts on wildlife and other ecosystems. So it, it, it really makes you wonder, why does Procter & Gamble continue to harm the environment? And the answer is ridiculous. It's so they can make things like soap, beauty products, and you guys mentioned it earlier, toilet paper. It's especially frustrating because there are more envir environmentally friendly ways to do all of these things. And I think that it's time for P&G to take responsibility for their business practices and change their ways. I understand the importance of climate critical ecosystems like the boreal forest because my generation is going to have to figure out how we resolve climate change. And to conclude, I know that we're going to, and to conclude, I know that we need to be sounding the alarm whenever we see climate injustices. So here's a video that I made for my TikTok channel about Charmin, uh, one of Procter & Gamble's subsidiaries. Oh, we can't hear well, the we sound on the... Oh, no. Can you... yeah, I can't hear any sound from it. Yeah, I'm just gonna ask whoever's showing the video to go back to the beginning and make sure when you're sharing your screen, you click share sound as well, so we can hear, hear the sound in this video. Sorry about that, everybody, 30 seconds.
No, I'm afraid we still can't hear the sound from that video. Yeah. And just between 1996 ah. and 2015, 28 million. There we go. Now we can. Let's start it from the beginning. Thank the you. Commercials with the cute bears. Yeah. Turns out they're destroying the planet. The boreal forest is the largest intact forest in the world. And there's more than 600 indigenous communities that have lived there for millennia. And just between 1996 and 2015, 28 million acres of the boreal forest has been logged. That's a landmass about as big as Ohio. If every household replaced one roll of toilet paper to 100% recycled, it would save the equivalent of half a million trees. When tissue products are made from recycled materials, they're more sustainable, don't depend on cutting down large swaths of forests, and they only emit about a third of the greenhouse gases as tissue products made from virgin fiber. Charmin and even Costco's Kirkland brand are both made with 100% virgin fiber. Last year, Standa Earth and NRDC published a report called The Issue with Tissue, How Americans Are Flushing Forests Down the Toilet. Great title, by the way. And in that report, they made a sustainability scorecard to illustrate which brands are the most eco-friendly. Go to Stand.Earth to both follow the story and see what you can do to help. And you can also follow them on Instagram at stand.earth. Fantastic. Thank you, Tryson. I can't believe how much you can squish into such a very small um, video. That was fantastic. Thanks, Zipporah. We're going to switch gears now um, to another part of the world um, and learn about Procter & Gamble's impact and what they can do, specifically in Indonesia and Malaysia. Rainforest Action Network and Friends at the Earth um, are joining us to tell us uh, about the, a different commodity connected to Procter & Gamble in an entirely different part of the world. First, let's turn to Bria Morgan, the senior forest campaigner with Rainforest Action Network, who will help us understand the deforestation and human rights issues and violations in Procter & Gamble's palm oil supply chains. Bria? Yeah, hey, um, thank you so much. You know, I think we've heard a lot about the impact that Procter & Gamble is having in the Canadian boreal. And, you know, it's important to recognize that that's a critical ecosystem. And along with that, Procter & Gamble is also having um, really devastating uh, environmental and social impacts across the world. And so, yeah, I just am going to talk a, very briefly just about the impact that um, Procter & Gamble's sourcing of palm oil from Indonesia and Malaysia has. So, you know, for folks who are maybe a little bit less familiar with what's going on in that part of the world, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia are the largest sources in the world for palm oil, palm oil being a oil that's incredibly cheap and is used in many household products. It's used in um, Procter & Gamble's Pantene soap uh, conditioners. It's used in a bunch of different soap products. Um, and the way that they produce palm oil is often by clear cutting um, pristine um, tropical forests and peatlands, peatlands being some of the most carbon rich soil in the world. So what we've seen in Indonesia and Malaysia is that Indonesia has become the world's fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases because of land conversion, because of fires that are happening in their forests and because of the conversion of this carbon rich peat soil um, to agricultural land. You know, these forests are also critical. They're critical for our climate and they're critical for, critical for biodiversity. Um, Indonesia just has about 1% of the Earth's land areas. It's an archipelago with many thousands of islands. Um, and, but what we know is that it actually contains 10% of the world's known plant species, 12% of the mammal species, and 17% of all known bird species. So these, these forests are just absolutely critical for maintaining the biodiversity of the world. It's also home to many, you know, animals and plants that are threatened by extinction, uh, including incredible species like Sumatran tigers and orangutans. So these are, this is who, and these are the areas and these are the animals that are being put at risk as Procter & Gamble um, is sourcing their palm oil. Um, you know, and it's not just the climate and it's not just biodiversity that's at risk. You know, what we're seeing is that frontline and indigenous communities are also um, being truly hurt by Procter & Gamble's unsustainable and um, unjust sourcing policies. So, 
the way that it works in Indonesia and in much of Malaysia is that communities don't have legal rights to their land. This is true in many indigenous communities around the world. They have used it for generations upon generations and they, in their communities, know exactly who has what piece of land, but that's not recognized legally. And so these companies are able to come in and clear cut farms. They're able to destroy villages and to really make people destroy areas where communities are um, dependent on the forests for their livelihoods and their lives into plantations. Next slide. So Procter & Gamble is failing to fully implement its no deforestation policy. You know, policies are great, but what we really care about is how those impact communities and forests on the ground. Um, so we see that the bulk of Procter & Gamble's procurement for palm oil comes from irresponsible sources. Um, you know, these are, these are sources that are not, that have not followed uh, the round table on sustainable palm oil, which is, you know, sort of the, the working standard. It's, it's, it's a pretty weak standard. So if you're choosing sources that don't come from RSPO sources, you know, you're, you know, you're scraping from the bottom of the barrel. Um, you know, Procter & Gamble's list of source mills contains 15 companies that had active forest and peatland clearance as recently as 2019. And that we also know that Procter & Gamble isn't taking responsibility. They're not addressing um, cases of non-compliance, but they're relying on their direct suppliers and failing um, to mitigate those risks. So these suppliers are really at the cause of the problems. And so um, I'm going to introduce um, Esmeralda Lopez, who's going to speak a little bit about some of the horrific labor practices that have been happening on the ground um, in some of the uh, plantations P&G sources from. Esmeralda? Thank you. So FGV is one of Malaysia's largest palm oil companies and is Procter & Gamble's joint venture partner and largest supplier. In 2015, the Wall Street Journal reported um, and first exposed ties to forced labor and human trafficking on FGV palm oil plantations. And my organization, just for a little bit of background, Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum, a very long name, um, is a strategy hub which seeks to defend worker rights and build power. And we were one of three co-petitioners, including Rainforest Action Network and some of us, that on August 15th, 2019, filed what's called the Tariff Act petition with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The Tariff Act petition that we submitted was seeking to stop the importation of palm oil products that were produced by FGV. Under the U.S. Tariff Act of 1930, U.S. Customs and Border Protection is required to deny entry of goods that arrive at U.S. ports if there's reason to believe that the products were made by forced labor. Our complaint cited field reports documenting cases of forced labor and human trafficking on FGV palm oil plantations across Malaysia. Procter & Gamble took no public action until after the complaint was filed. And even then that action has been very limited and mostly empty promises. On September 30th of this year, so very recently, U.S. Customs and Border Protection announced a block on imports of FGV palm oil, which will have a clearly significant impact on Procter & Gamble. Three complaints have been submitted to U.S. Customs and Border Protection against palm oil companies in Malaysia. Two against FGV. The first was filed in June of 2019. And then, a, and then the third, we were the, um, the recent one, the one that we filed was filed was the second one. And then a third one was filed by Liberty Shared against another palm oil plantation company. Broad Tariff Act enforcement like this and this block is only the first step to ending forced labor. There needs to be binding agreements that include buyer suppliers and workers organizations. We also want these agreements to include models that help workers with collective bargaining rights, community benefits and enforceable agreements. We also have to ensure that there's transparent monitoring grievance mechanisms and protections from retaliation for workers and create binding accountability 
for failure to remediate. Voluntary promises by companies to stop forced labor in their supply chains, which are not enforceable, sometimes is called corporate social responsibility, does not work. Given FGV's particularly terrible record of not keeping its promises, the law must be upheld until there's real change made. And so we're pushing um, that we be included as petitioners in, in part of this enforcement of this ban and that we ensure that the migrant workers' rights are, given, are protected and, get, and that they're given the rights that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're also now um, going to hear um, from Jeff Collins, who's the Senior International Forest Program Manager for Friends of the Earth in the US. He's also got some community member testimonies from Ind Indonesia that he's gonna queue up for us. Jeff? Yeah, thank you, Zipporah, and thank you everybody for listening. Um, I hope to be very brief here. I'm going to carry on with, well, what we've just heard is, um, that Procter & Gamble's largest palm oil supplier from Southeast Asia is now having their palm oil detained by customs at the U.S. border because of forced labor abuses. That's very significant. I'm going to share uh, testimonies about two other um, of Procter & Gamble's primary palm oil um, suppliers from Indonesia. Uh, this slide gives a little bit of detail, and then we're going to follow this uh, with a couple of videos to hear directly from people in Indonesia who couldn't be on the call because the time zone is too different and language and so forth. In any case, um, one of um, P&G's other main suppliers, Golden Agri Resources, is uh, the second largest palm oil company in the world. And... Uh, in 2018, uh, the company had three executives arrested by the Indonesian Anti-Corruption Commission for bribing officials to overlook chemical dumping in a lake in, uh, in Borneo, in central Kalimantan, Borneo. In 2019, those executives were convicted uh, and they're in jail currently. The company claims that these were individuals acting on their own behalf. It's very mysterious because those individuals were using uh, company money to bribe provincial um, legislators to look the other way in a case of chemical dumping. Very significant case of corruption there. In 2020, just this year, um, a complaint was filed to the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil that 75,000 hectares, that's over 150,000 acres of, of GAR's uh, land, lacks permits, um, meaning those are illegal concessions, illegal plantations um, that they're managing. And another of, um, of PNG's primary palm oil suppliers from Indonesia is a company called Astra Agro Lestari, which also lacks legal permits and is um, involved in ongoing land conflicts in a, in a different province, central Sulawesi. Um, so one of the underlying points here is that in order to get control over, uh, in order to be able to clear massive areas of, of primary forest for their plantations, the companies actually need to first get control over the land. And how do they do that? They do that through what we call land grabbing, through false permits, and through direct acts of violence against the communities. So now in a couple of videos, um, we're going to hear first from um, a farmer in central Sulawesi who's been arrested numerous times for defending his community's land. Uh, and then we'll hear from a, a second province. Please show the videos. Thanks. Saya preman, 
nomor tetap kami bisa usah dari lokasi kami di tahun 2017 saya masuk kembali bicara dengan teman-teman dengan perusahaan yang melakukan saya dengan perusahaan di Astra di Timur Puang sampai pada tahun 2018 saya lagi berhubungan oleh perusahaan di tahun 2018 ini saya di perusahaan ini di mana di kalah itu perusahaan PT Astra Agroestar ini di Mampuang tidak pernah memperlihatkan peta HGU-nya atau mengatakan terlihat oh, HGU-nya itu tidak pernah kemudian mereka hanya berdasar ya, bekerja selama ini masyarakat menjadi asal mereka namun tetapi perusahaan PT Astra ini tidak pernah memperlihatkan HGU-nya. Coba perlihatkan kepada kami petani, apakah lokasi kami masuk di wilayah petani HGU itu? yang dibuat berkali-kali itu tidak membuat kami getar tidak membuat kami menyerah walaupun berkali-kali PT Astra Agrolestari, PT Mereti, PT Memuang memenjarakan saya saya tetap, tetap semangat tetap mempertahankan saya punya hak saya berharap dan beranggap kepada diri saya bahwa kebenaran itu ada di depan saya All right. So technology doesn't always uh, work in our favor, but that was uh, clearly the story of a, a farmer being criminalized uh, for protesting land grabbing by a PNG supplier and in uh, central Sulawesi, Indonesia. And this gentleman, Dimas Hartono, is the executive director of Friends of the Earth Central Kalimantan, Indonesia, who is going to talk to us about golden agri resources um, for about three minutes. Let's hear the video. Thanks. Saya Dimas Novian Hartono, Direktur Eksekutif Walhi Kalimantan Tengah. Saat ini kami sedang melakukan advokasi terkait uh, korupsi dan pencemaran yang dilakukan oleh PT Bina Sawit Abadi Pratama, di mana perusahaan tersebut merupakan anak dari PT Golden Agri Resource yang uh, minyak sawitnya dibeli oleh PNG. Kami dari Walhi, Kalimantan Tengah, meminta Procter Gamble berhenti membeli minyak sawit dari Golden Agri Resource, serta menuntut agar Golden Agri Resource menghentikan deforestasi, perampasan tanah, dan pencemaran lingkungan yang terjadi di Sembulu, Kalimantan Tengah. Karena apa yang kalian lakukan telah melanggar dan merusak tatanan hidup di Indonesia, khususnya di Kalimantan Tengah. PT Bina Sawit Abadi Pratama adalah sebuah perusahaan yang bergerak di bidang perkebunan kelapa sawit kita biasa menyikat perusahaan tersebut dengan nama BAP. Perusahaan ini merupakan anak perusahaan milik Sinarmas Group atau dikenal dengan nama Golden Agri Resource, GAR. Dalam proses aktivitas perusahaan tersebut, mereka diduga melakukan pencemaran lingkungan, khususnya di Danau Sembulu, Kabupaten Serian, Kalimantan Tengah. Anak usaha Sinarmas ini beroperasi sejak tahun 2006, dan juga di, kita ketahui belum memiliki izin yang sangat lengkap atau belum memiliki izin yang lengkap. Di, di antaranya adalah perusahaan tersebut belum memiliki hak guna usaha dan izin guna kawasan hutan atau izin IPPKH serta belum memiliki jaminan cadangan kawasan karena tanah kelapa sawit yang ada di dalam e, wilayah area perusahaan tersebut berada di dalam kawasan hutan. Korupsi atau suap yang dilakukan oleh PT BAP itu diberikan kepada anggota legislatif Dewan Perwakilan Rakyat Daerah Provinsi Kalimantan Tengah. Harapannya dengan uang suap tersebut dapat meluruskan berita terkait dugaan pencemaran limbah oleh PT BAP. Dan juga agar peran dari DPRD tersebut menghilangkan fungsi proses pengawasannya karena apabila itu dilakukan akan berdampak pada pencabutan izin perusahaan tersebut. 
modus yang dilakukan dengan melakukan suap uh, agar DPR tidak menjalankan fungsi proses pengawasan yang tadi saya bilang sebelumnya dan dugaan pencemaran yang dilakukan oleh PT Bina Abadi Sawit Pratama ini uh, tidak diangkat ke media dan dihilangkan begitu saja. Kami meminta Procter dan Gamble atau PNG berhenti membeli minyak sawit dari Golden Agri Resource dan menuntut agar PNG dapat uh, meminta atau memaksa PT Golden Agri Resource untuk menghentikan deforestasi, perampasan tanah, serta pencemaran lingkungan yang terjadi di Danau Sembuluh atau yang terjadi di Indonesia. Terima kasih. Wow, powerful um, stories uh, from the front lines. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. You know, we've, we've heard a lot uh, this morning. Thank you to all of those who have uh, stuck with us, um, which is actually looking at the participants, the majority um, of you. Um, and now we're gonna have um, some time for questions, uh, which is great. You know, we've heard on this webinar so far about corruptions. We've heard about greenwashing. We've heard about farmers criminalized about threatened species habitat uh, and critical old growth forests being destroyed to make toilet paper. So what needs to happen now? I'm going to ask you to go back uh, to the last slide, please. It's clear that Procter and Gamble needs to take action if they want to claim to be a company that is uh, socially responsible and environmentally responsible. They need to ensure that their supply chain um, is clean uh, and they have policies that encourage the right actions. We actually had some questions um, on, on Twitter and social media. Well, why the company? The governments uh, should do this. And I'll take the liberty of addressing that before we go into um, this Q&A. Um, why does Procter & Gamble need to, see, to do what you see on their screen? Why do they need to ensure suppliers uh, uphold free prior and informed consent? when in indigenous and traditional territories to end greenwashing, to step up or meet or exceed uh, what their peer companies are doing in their field. They need to phase out working with suppliers that don't comply with the 65% habitat intactness thresholds to get more recycled in tissue products. And of course, as we've heard in Indonesia and Malaysia, they need to commit to respect human rights, preserve in intact ecosystems, phase out of using suppliers that are non-RSPO certified and fully implement deforestation policy with full traceability to the plantation level and sanctions for non-compliance. So why does Procter & Gamble have to do this? Why can't um, it just be that the governments ensure that companies are sourcing responsibly? I've been working on corporate campaigns uh, for over 25 years um, and they work. And the reason they work is Procter & Gamble and other major uh, uh, sourcing companies have financial power to ensure change. At this moment in history, we are all called to do everything that we can uh, to ensure change. And, and for those of us living on the West Coast, choked by uh, smoke or even worse, um, racing to flee their homes as a result of the wildfires, we know all too well, um, those in Indonesia dealing with the floods, etc., that our world is changing in large part because of irresponsible practices and our collective responsibility to address climate change. Corporations like Procter & Gamble, when they make statements, when they make policies, like they won't source from, com from logging companies operating in the critical 65%, can change policies. They have the power and influence to change what happens on the ground. So first and foremost, they make sure that their supply is clean, that they're a company um, uh, that is operating in an environmentally and socially responsible way, which of course is critical, especially given increasing investor concern. But they also set in place a chain of reactions. We've seen it from the Great Bear Rainforest to um, the Amazon. We've seen companies take action, banks, investors take action, and that has changed the future of those critical ecosystems. Let's hear a bit more uh, from our panelists. I'd ask um, uh, the moderate team, the uh, tech team to take down that slide so we can see all of the panelists. We've had a lot of uh, questions come in. I'm gonna start with you, uh, Shelley. We have questions around um, whether there are reference points. Is there someone, are there some companies that are doing some of the right thing? 
Um, so are there large companies or even smaller ones that can be reference points for Procter & Gamble as they consider um, moving in the right direction on these key issues? Maybe Shelley, first to you on, on um, uh, Boreal issues, um, and then we'll turn over to Bria uh, and, and Jeff. Great, yes, thanks, uh, Zipporah. Um, you know, you, you can look no further than the scorecards that NRDC and Stand.Earth um, released a year and a half ago to see that there are plenty of companies out there um, that are making tissue products that aren't coming at the cost of climate critical forests. Um, companies like, and we released a new scorecard earlier this year with um, even more brands um, who are um, offer tissue products that are made from recycled content and sustainable alternative fibers. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about toilet paper. It's a product we use for seconds and flush down the toilet. And the idea that a company as big and as wealthy as Procter & Gamble must rely on some of the last remaining intact forests on the planet to make this product and can't use their innovation to create something that's made more sustainably. Um, it just doesn't hold water, um, particularly when there are so many other brands out there that are doing far better. Thank you. What about as it relates to um, uh, Indonesia and, and, and Malaysia? J Jeff, can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, one thing to note is that while having really, you know, bad practices both in the boreal and in Southeast Asia, one of the things that PNG really needs to do is have a cross commodity commitment is have a, a commitment to ending deforestation in all of their supply chains across the world, right? Whether it's for pulp and paper, or whether it's for, for palm oil. On the palm oil side, Procter & Gamble has a, a commitment to no deforestation, no exploitation, and um, no peatland development. And you can clearly see from the three cases we've highlighted that they're not implementing that commitment in any robust mm -hmm. way. They're not taking, you know, they're not taking responsibility for it. So what we need them to do is we need them to trace their supply chains all the way to the plantation level so that we can see exactly where all of their palm oil is coming from. Um, and then we need them to sanction um, and possibly suspend and possibly cancel business relationships with any of the suppliers that are violating the, the, the terms of their no deforestation, no exploitation commitment. Uh, and that's something that up until now they've been completely unwilling to do. Um, but if they're buying from companies that are engaged actively in, you know, in bribery, in corruption, in forced labor, and in massive deforestation, their uh, no deforestation uh, policy on paper clearly isn't working. Mm, thank you. Abri, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think that was a great summary. Thanks, Jeff. Perfect. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm noticing the chat from some of our um, uh, experts online that there is also other companies in the like the target brand um, which is now 50 percent recycled so going back to the boreal issue 365 brand which is 100 percent recycled seventh generation so we are seeing um, some in the sector move uh, to decrease their impact um, can you um, uh, can one of our panelists give us a sense what is the level of concern uh, from financial institutions with a stake in Procter & Gamble? We've seen a lot of uh, commitments by financial institutions and certainly Rainforest Action Network has been at the forefront of doing a lot of that work on banks for many, many years. Are we hearing concern from financial institutions when it comes to uh, Procter & Gamble's uh, practices and policies? Maybe. Who wants to take that? Um, Shelly can certainly speak to that. I'll just jump in. I've joined a number of calls with investors with, with Shelly over the last couple of weeks. And one thing to say is uh, the New York City Comptroller's Office, which manages the New York City pension funds, sent a letter to, um, to State Street, the third largest asset manager in the world, telling State Street expressly to vote uh, in favor of, the, of this resolution at Procter & Gamble. Um, and maybe I'll leave it to Shelley to speak to some of the other engagements that we've had with Procter & Gamble's key shareholders. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, it, it's, um, there's certainly been a lot of investor interest in this issue and, and about 
PNG's practices. Um, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, we have we will have met with 30% of PNG's shareholders by the shareholder meeting um, to discuss the concerns and uh, what we see as PNG's failure to, to act on these issues. Um, and you know, they've they've asked, um, they've expressed that they um, they view PNG as lagging behind other um, other peer companies, not just in uh, in commitments, but also in approach. And um, there's a, a general lack of accountability at the highest levels for these very serious concerns. Um, and uh, there's there's a, a lack of escalation and transparency of dealing with grievance processes. And that is, is a contrast between Procter & Gamble and how they deal with um, grievances brought to them about their sustainability policies um, and, and how other companies, for example, like Unilever, who has a grievance process. Interesting. I'm going to try and kind of roll a couple of questions together, given the time, um, and ask our, our, our panelists to address the conversation as though Procter & Gamble were here. So if Procter & Gamble, which it turns out, looking at the participants, many are um, watching. So if Procter & Gamble were part of this panel, um, uh, what would they be saying? What is their response? What is the level of current dialogue uh, with them right now? Um, Shelley, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you first um, because uh, we've heard and we see a number of questions about this question of recycled paper. The, the Procter & Gamble says, um, uh, you know, they can't increase uh, recycled content, um, et cetera. So if Procter & Gamble were here right now, um, what would they say about why they're not acting and continuing to source um, uh, from, from these places? And, and how do you respond to that? Well, p and has two different approaches um, when it comes to particularly their boreal pulp sourcing. Um, first, they say that they can't make a product that it, that's not using 100% virgin forest fiber and still have it be consumer preferred. And this is kind of a nebulous term that, um, you know, provides a lot of cover for the company to continue its existing practices. Um, and when you, again, looking at how many brands out there have actually moved in the direction of using more sustainable fibers, putting um, products on their, on their shelves that are made using recycled content, um, the number of startups that are being developed and invested in that, are, that use either 100% recycled content or bamboo fibers, for example, um, you can see that the, the market is shifting and PNG needs to recognize that there is a significant climate difference between its continued sourcing uh, from climate critical forests and using sustainable alternative fibers. Um, and, you know, with a company like Procter & Gamble, it's one of the largest companies in the world. It has the largest marketing budget. It has one of the largest R&D budgets. And it has the power to innovate in a way that smaller startup companies simply don't. And um, I think that the fact that startups are, are becoming so successful and popular belies the fact that it can't come up with a new way to do things. Um, and then p and will also deflect um, blame. They'll continue to point to the fact, to the idea that Canada's uh, forest practices are sustainable and that what's going on in the boreal forest is not a problem. And I think that everything that Dave and Rachel shared earlier, both about, you know, how forests are not recovering after decades, um, decades after logging occurs, and how boreal caribou habitat and populations continue to decline, um, it makes it very clear that those claims that Canada just by virtue of the fact that it's Canada, um, that sourcing there is sustainable. It's, it's just not true. Thank you. Um, and um, Esmeralda, maybe I'll turn to you. If, if Procter & Gamble, um, is there a dialogue with them about the issues that you raised? Is there, um, what would they be saying right now uh, in, in, in their defense? Um, I suspect that they'd be saying that they've been make, they've been taking steps um, to make changes in their supply chains to guarantee that force or to you know make changes and try to mitigate forced labor in their supply chains. 
um, because that is sort of the message and talking point that we've heard over the years. Um, and they probably mentioned their work with the Fair Labor Association. I think, um, however, you know, you can only make promises for so long. And um, a lot of their action plans with FGV has an action plan with the Fair Labor Association, essentially to try to create some changes in, but those changes are very far out and it's been years since they've made some of these promises, even through the RSPO process. Um, and they haven't complied or kept any of these promises. So I think that it's time really for action and less about talking points and messaging and treating this like a corporate social responsibility sort of PR um, and really to do the right thing and take the steps and really take a responsibility. Um, because if you can't be responsible and understand your supply chain and what's happening and how it's being produced, then you can't do that. You shouldn't be able to do business. Um, mm. And it, it's time to start using ignorance or willful ignorance as an excuse. But let, let's, let's, let's keep following that point for a minute. Um, Jeff, I want to turn to you about this question of, um, uh, that Esmeralda has raised around the importance of following the supply chain, knowing um, what's in their supply chain. So um, Procter & Gamble um, did agree to publish its, its palm oil mill list, though I, I, I note in the questions and in the responses in the Q&A that they certainly are not publishing their suppliers um, in the Boreal or any information yet about that. Um, uh, why did they do that? Um, and when did they do that? And what's happened since? Yeah, and Bria, feel free to weigh in if you have some details there. Um, Greenpeace, among others, um, has been campaigning on Procter & Gamble for some years. And I want to say it was in 2018 when um, Greenpeace was putting a lot of pressure on. So a number of consumer brands have um, on paper have no deforestation, no exploitation commitments and Greenpeace and others put a lot of direct pressure on those consumer brands to uh, comply with their policies by publishing their lists of mills and um, Procter and Gamble refused to do so and refused to do so and refused to do so until virtually every other consumer uh, company that was coming under that same pressure had published their mill list and Greenpeace told them, we are going to go live with these, you know, with the news from all these consumer brands that they've published their mill lists, uh, you know, next week. And Procter and Gamble is clearly failing. And Procter and Gamble very quickly, um, after saying they couldn't, you know, they didn't have the information, et cetera. They very quickly did have the information. They came up with it and they published the mill list. Um, ultimately, mm -hmm. so it's really, you know, pressure from civil society that does it. Ultimately, what we need is not just lists of the mills that they use, but we need trans transparency and traceability to the plantation level, um, not just to the mills. Um, but I guess the underlying point is more pressure is needed to, to shame them into producing the information that we know they have. Well, this certainly is um, an ongoing story and we'll all be watching Procter & Gamble very closely in the run up to their AGM. And of course, watching what happens in Cincinnati with the um, uh, uh, three day vigil um, that's going on there earlier in the, in the webinar, we heard from people on the ground in Cincinnati in front of Procter & Gamble headquarters. Um, you know, we noted in this in this webinar, Procter and Gamble has done has taken some good steps. Of course, um, many people on this webinar will know they doubled their FSC fiber use. But what they have done so far is not enough to ensure that the company is environmentally and socially responsible, nor um, that we're not seeing these devastating impacts on the ground. I want to thank our panelists um, for uh, uh, providing such wide ranging information this morning um, and for all the work that you continue to do to ensure accountability and transparency. I want to urge everyone who's joined us today to follow Stand.Earth, Friends of the Earth and Rainforest Action Network as this story unfolds. We hope to be able to tell you a good story about how Procter & Gamble has acted and led um, in um, addressing some of these issues in the months to come. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for caring and about these issues. Stay safe, everyone.